right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new segment that we are doing called Outside the Actor's Studio. I'm here with Jeff Phillips, and once again, my name is Jason Acott, and uh, we, uh, we are here just to uh, kind of learn a little bit more about our local performers. Uh, some of you may have seen Jeff in many, many things uh, at the Thalian Hall stage or just around town um, because he is a, a man about town. A man about town! <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would like to say that we have uh, been socially distancing before this and we're trying to, to keep some space as well as um, be outside uh, so that we can be a little bit distant. But uh, just and wearing mask right before this. Yes. Oh yes, I've got mine right here in my pocket. And I'm wearing my good banana shirt uh, for this interview. Alright, so Jeff, yes. um, I, uh, hey put Jason. Hi. <laughs> I put together some of these questions um, just to kind of, um, uh, to learn, like I said, we're between two ferns. Between two ferns. Fantastic. I know. <laughs> um, so that we can find out a little bit more about you. Let's okay. start off right at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Asheville, North Carolina, so the western part of the state, and my family had been there since Jesus was a baby. Uh, all born and pretty much buried there. But I split my youth between Abbeville, South Carolina from about kindergarten to fifth grade, mm -hmm. and then Shelby, North Carolina from sixth grade through end of high school. Ah, Shelby. Ah, Shelby, the city of pleasant living. <laughs> all right. It's an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> so, what got you started in theater? You know, my road to theater was not one I chose, quite frankly. I, I grew up in um, the Southern Baptist Church, Pentecostal Church. So I grew up with a good number of my family in who participated in Southern Gospel music. And then another part of my family were all classically trained musicians, Juilliard trained musicians. And which was unusual coming from back in the day with Asheville, it was it was still a little mountain town. And right. We lived out. You know, we were we didn't have money. We were not wealthy. Um, so to sort of come up with even those two options as outlets for any artistic expression was really unique for us. Uh, but church is theater. Mm -hmm. So I never wanted to be on the stage as far as Thalian was concerned. I always knew that I was fascinated with the pastors and how pastors delivered their sermon, how they told a joke, how they engaged the, the congregation, mm -hmm. and then also watching singers, what they did, how they moved, how they blocked themselves. Right. So that was really sort of my entree into theatricality. Coming along, I, I remember in fifth grade, my best friend was Courtney Heath, and Courtney was... Shout out to Courtney. Hey, Courtney. Uh, was the Jason Acock of Abbeville. Um, he did all the theater. I was in sports, and I was a science nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know I could carry a tune. Uh, Courtney was the singer, Courtney was the actor, Courtney did all the parts. I just sort of was his friend and sat in the audience. And I remember I did my first big solo, I think I was in maybe third grade, uh, There is a River. Um, and it didn't really register with me other than people said, oh, he can sing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know really what that meant. But fifth grade, I was in drama club with Courtney just because he made me go to drama club. But then I was in science club, and I got a call over the loud loudspeaker, Jeff Phillips, please report to Mrs. Goins Chorus room. Because chorus was a club. Right. It wasn't uh, a class like band was. And so I walk into the choral room, and there were 300 kids in there where there had been maybe nine in the science club and so I just sort of listened I didn't know why I was there and Mrs. Goins Betty Goins called me up to the piano and said okay we're gonna sing some stuff and um, I'd been listening to the other people sing and they would sing so like red nose Rudolph the red nose reindeer they're like 
Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Dixon. She goes, now Jeff, will you sing this for me? And I said, you know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Dixon. Because <laughs> I had listened to the Ray Conniff singers. Right. I had listened to all those people. So I was just imitating what I heard. And I remember seeing 300 faces go, Okay. <laughs> so I did all the solos. <laughs> and sorry, Courtney, you didn't. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I got into it through there a little bit. And then as I got into high school, my church in Shelby, Bob Deals, shout out to Bob Deals, who was our musical, our, our minister of music, they did large scale plays, musicals, mm -hmm. religious based musicals. And I started getting some of the solos. I never really got the speaking parts, I got the solo parts. Right. And I remember in 10th or 11th grade, we did a show, and I was playing Downey Thomas, and I had the big sort of ballad number in the evening. And I remember dressed in a robe, dressed in the costumes, stepping up to the microphone and it was the first time I ever realized there was a, a spotlight and a microphone. And something overtook me and I just I just went to my world interpreting the song. And out in the congregation that evening were all the theater nerds. Because I was an athlete. I swam and all of that. And I remember that their response was really sort of overwhelming. Because I had, I didn't even know where the theater club was. I didn't know anything about auditions. I never mm -hmm. looked for them. I could care less. Um, but David Baldry, shout out David Baldry, um, <laughs> was there that night, and David was the big star, the male star of Shelby, or at least of the generation that I was coming up there. Because you know, in high school, they pick one person and they sort of follow them through and pick the senior show or the senior year musical for that person, which I had not been involved in at all. I think David went back and said something to Richard Dedman, who was the director of our theater program. And our well, Malcolm Brown sits 1,200 people with turntables and everything. So wow. it's, it's, yeah, it's big. Um, so when the musical came around my senior year, which was Dames at Sea, um, I think it had been picked for Nina Lynn Blanton, Nina Repetta, who I, Nina Repetta and I graduated together in 1985. I think it had been picked for her and someone else. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, because my year, 1985, had a lot of strong performers. All of equal leading talent. So Dames at Sea has a lot of really rich little parts for people but um, Dick and Ruby are the tap dancing sweethearts and I got pulled out of the pool I had somebody one of the tech staff came and pulled me out of the pool and said Mr. Devin would like to see you can you go down and talk to her so I, got like out the pool. I was dripping wet <laughs> I mean it's literally dripping wet put on my sweatsuit walked from the auditorium to Malcolm Brown auditorium and Richard was there, the choreographer was there, who was one of the local dance teachers. And Richard says, and I had done the talent show also. He says, can you sing? So I sang the only thing I knew, which was like a Barry Manilow song. I sang that a cappella. And then Frances, who was the dance teacher and choreographer, she goes, can I show you something? I said, oh, okay. So she showed me a time step. Mm -hmm. And so I picked up the time step and then got cast in the lead. And the rest is history. And the, I guess that was my first entree into it, but I didn't do anything else until I wrote plays and skits through college for other people, for other groups to make money. Cool. I, I would write their you know, competitive pieces for homecoming, mm -hmm. and I would direct them, help them costume it. But I was never in them. Uh, but I didn't do anything until I was out of college. You know, I 
think that was age 20, it was 1990 before I did another play. Okay. So six years. Wow. So that's a long story, but I think, you know, it's, it's, I think people think a lot of people in theater have done this all their life. They yearn to do it. That was never, that was never me. I never yearned to be rich or famous or be on the stage. That was just not in my peripheral view. I just really fell into it because I could carry it to me yeah. and pick up time step. And, and, and the rest is history. The rest, <laughs> yeah, well, the rest is history. <laughs> All right, then. What brought you to Wilmington? Ironically, it was the time step. <laughs> uh, I had done a show called Big River in Charlotte, North Carolina, directed by Ron Chisholm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shout out to Ron. Shout out to Ron. <laughs> and it's all about connections. And I, it was a huge deal in Charlotte. I don't know why this particular show, mm -hmm. maybe because it's a leading man's role that you're on stage for two and a half hours and it's all singing these great Roger Miller songs. Mm -hmm. It was the only cast album I owned. Really? The only one, but I knew everybody's part. Because it was a show or because it was Roger Miller? Because it was Roger Miller. Oh. And I liked the music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't really know how I heard it. Uh, so I'd gone into audition. Huge, huge audition. I'm thinking I didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of getting it because I was going to be the tallest huck in history. <laughs> um, but ended up getting it, and the show was so successful that, you know, some people had heard about it. And it was Ron's first year, 1991, coming to direct here, here in Wilmington. And he was scheduled to court, to direct and choreograph Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and a chorus line. So I was actually slated to come do Mark in a chorus line. Mm -hmm. And Lou Criscola's son, Michael, shout out to Michael, shout out to Michael. Uh, hurt his knee. He was one of the Aggies. So I came in earlier and actually replaced Michael in that show as the Swedish Aggie, which I don't know why Mac Michael was cast as the Swedish, maybe the <laughs> Italian. Um, but I came in and, and, and you know fulfilled that role for him. And that's how I got here, which is when I met Lou and I got my start I think in Wilmington, really what was his history for me is that I made Lou laugh the first time he ever saw me. And I had only one word of dialogue in the show, and that was Yahi. And because, you know, you go, Yeehaw! It goes down. I went, Yahi! And went up and just sort of held it. And I heard this roar of laughter from the back of the theater. Unmistakable. Unmistakable and got cast in the lead of Living Tenor and all my other leads, based off one word. That's incredible. It's one word. Because you're always auditioning. Always. Always. That's how I got here. All right. So, and this, you, we may have already covered this one, but uh, maybe not. What is one of your favorite moments on stage? We haven't covered that. Okay. Um, you know, as you gain experience, it's not always those moments that's just you on the stage that are your favorite ones. Because, you know, I can think of moments, you know, I just saw um, the producers with you and me and Anthony and uh, Michael, uh, Sean, excuse me, Sean, and there's a moment where I just sort of milk the audience while y'all are on the floor wrestling around. Oh, yes. And I love moments like that. They're sort of in the moment discovered. You know, you sort of remember them. Uh, you know, I think certainly working with Dick Bunting and Hairspray and the just the number that we developed and the, the reaction from the crowd, just two middle-aged men, everybody's buying in that they're a married couple. That was pretty special. It, it took a while. But recently, in La Caja Fold, it was something that happened in rehearsal. We didn't talk about it. It was organic. 
And I knew it was the most critical moment in the entire show, that if we didn't nail this moment, the show was the show was sunk. Right. And it's the apology scene between um, Mathis Turner's character, who played my stepson, and myself at the end. And if we didn't nail that, it didn't matter what happened before that. And Mathis gave such a beautiful initial reading of it in rehearsal that I started crying. Just, just tears flowed. And he was sharp enough to realize sort of the visceral reaction I was having to it. Mm -hmm. And so it went from sort of playing it to both the parents to playing it to me and him, which had been the bone of contention right. for the show. And Richard White, who played my husband in it, was also clever enough to sort of back out of that scene. And I remember waiting for it. We worked towards it every night. We get to it, and he would just nail it. And there's a moment where I had the physicality of a gasp. And did we won him the gasp, and then the audience, went, oh, and you could feel the energy from that point. The audience was the, the on board. and it just you could. Feel, it's almost like shrink wrapping the show. It all you could feel it crystallizing and coming together. In that, that one moment, it was beautiful. It was that's great. I wish that for everybody. Mm -hmm. But that's all. But the the parts I'm talking about are all the team parts. Mm -hmm. or, you know, it's not just one person. It's everyone's input into it. So there's a lot of that. If you are just joining us, not like this is live or anything, but if you've just tuned into this, uh, we are doing outside the actor studio with Jeff Phillips. Um, we are outside his beautiful home. Uh, you may hear uh, uh, other happenings in the neighborhood. That's right. <laughs> there are pools being put in. There's construction work being done. Um, and we are just going through some fun questions to get yeah. to know a little bit more about Jeff. All right, Jeff, what's something in your past work that you would like to revisit? I've been lucky with this mm -hmm. because I've gotten to revisit two shows by I got to revisit Secret Garden, mm -hmm. and I got to revisit Chicago. That's a gift. I understand that. The show that I really want to revisit again is Hairspray. I really, I really want to do it. I would even love to do it with the same cast, because I, I don't think those kids have to be that young again. I mean, I think it can be. Well, and on Broadway, they. And were, on Broadway, yeah. they were older. Um, but you know, the way we work, and people are always amazed by how fast we put up a show. So when we're putting up a show, you know, like Lacage, I may have had maybe 12 hours of rehearsal, cumulatively, to mm -hmm. put that show up mm -hmm. for a, a four week run. Three week, yeah, four week, how it is. Um, and, and Hairspray was equally fast and it was the first time I had ever done, it, I don't really call it a drag part because you're really playing a woman, but I was in drag. Mm -hmm. And I just was worried about, am I telling the story or am I an obstacle to the story? Even though I know Divine had played it and Harvey Firestein had played it, but was my part gonna further our story right. and get what we needed to do? And so, by the time you get in and you open and you get running and you find all the beats, it's over. It's time to close. It's time to close. So I sort of would like to do hair spray again. Yeah, I got you. I was in that one too. I he was in that one. Shout out Jason Aycock. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's a show you never care to do again? High Society. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> now, let me, let me explain why. All right. Um, I did not want to be in the show. I did not go into audition for the show. <laughs> I was wrangled into the show. I love everybody in the show. Um, it just, for me, it did not work. I got so I had to, there are shows I've seen mm -hmm. that I wish we would never do again. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, there are shows that connect with you 
And then there are shows that don't, and, but, and that, I think that makes a big difference. But the beauty of doing theater, and if, if anybody's watching and, and there's a little bar down there saying, you know, please donate to theater, the beauty of doing local theater mm -hmm. is that we have the opportunity, many of us have the opportunity, to do things that we may be perfect for, or we're not sure we're perfect for, and it works out, or maybe we're not. But that's the beauty of being able to do theater at this level. Mm -hmm. is because you get opportunities to do things that you wouldn't anywhere else because you're sort of pigeonholed. Right. And we still battle against that in Wilmington. And it's a chance to learn and grow. It is. Yeah. It, is. it is. It is. So, yes. All right. <laughs> so, um, going along with that, what are some tips you have for young performances here in town or anybody out there that may be watching this? <laughs> we touched on a little bit of it earlier. You're always auditioning. Well, you are. You are always auditioning. You rarely, and I've learned this not only here, but when I was working in New York or when I was doing regional theater, anywhere, mm -hmm. is remember that theater is a business and theater is expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're talking just at our level where rights to a show can be twenty-five to $30,000, before you've done anything, you need to make sure that there is a market return. Mm -hmm. The risk, the return on investment is there. Um, and you, so you can't just sometimes put someone in who's new just because they might be the best person. You've got to put someone in who might be the second best person but has a history with your demographic and is known to be a team player, to work hard, and to get and to show up and not to get sick. Right. Right? A known variable. A known variable. Uh, and that is everywhere. So never take a, never turn down the part just because your ego thinks it's too small. If I had turned down whorehouse because of one word, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. Right. I would not have had the success I've had in Wilmington had I turned that down. Um, the other thing for people is uh, when you're in rehearsal, be at rehearsal. Watch what's going on. Watch those people who aren't getting the parts. Learn from the people who are more experienced than you. Mm -hmm. Get off your damn phone. <laughs> Pay attention. You know, steal right. from people. I do that in auditions all the time. I steal from everybody in an audition. Well, I mean, you can't make all the best jokes yourself. Might no. as well. No, and, and um, so watch. And the other thing, quit complaining about not getting a part on social media. You are ruining your reputation doing that. No one wants to work with Mark. I'm just going to be blunt. Every, anyone who knows me mm -hmm. knows I am upfront about stuff like this. So it's not touchy feely right now. But, <laughs> you know. Real talk with it's, Jeff it's, Phillips. It's real talk with Jeff Phillips. It's, you know, keep your business to yourself. This is an industry, this is a, a pastime, a hobby of rejection. Right. And yes, I've been doing this for 30 years next year. Yes, I've won the awards. Yes, I've had the parts. Yes, it seems like my existence has been a little charmed with all of that. But I don't talk about the parts I didn't get. Right. The many parts I didn't get. Either I was too old or too tall or too skinny or too fat or whatever it may be. Right. Some people are only just seeing a snapshot of you now. Exactly. And you know the shows that you do at Thaling Hall, that's our Broadway. Those are big shows, mm -hmm. you know, so you get a little bit more spotlight. So that's my advice, and also train. Right. You know, class, go to class, get the voice class, you know. A dance class. A yeah. dance class, yeah. an acting class. But the thing about working at the Opera House, or, or I don't I'm speak for Opera House, is that you get a lot of that training if you're open to it. Mm -hmm. Because people are more than willing to help you out. Take the time. But you got to be willing to be a, a gracious receiver of critique mm -hmm. or compliments. So. All right. Good advice. Yeah. Well.
All right, if you could have one job in the entire world, what would it be? I'm doing that job. I'm doing that job. Yeah. Um, I work for PPD, which is a clinical research organization. And, you know, when I was growing up, going back to some of our earlier discussion, you know, I wasn't a theater person at all. I was the nerdy sort of smart kid. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be in medicine since I was a little kid. Uh, I really thought I wanted to be, deliver babies. I wanted to be OBGYN. And when I got into undergraduate work, I just, there was some growing I needed to do and some self exploration and self actualization. And so I, I picked a different path um, that has led me back to sort of a job that allows me to make a difference on a daily basis in the lives of people globally to be a partner in the discovery of novel therapeutic indications that are saving lives or extending lives so that people can get maybe from June to Christmas with a loved one. It's a job that allows me to pull upon those pastoral speaking skills that I learned as a small kid, to be a teacher, because I love teaching, to to be the sort of the left brain right brain mm -hmm. and it has provided me with an opportunity to create a life for myself in Wilmington. Therefore I can do theater really as a hobby. Mm -hmm. I you know and my life is fuller because it's not just one compartmentalized portion that I'm spending time on. Right. So it really is the job what I do and for and with whom I work is the culmination of my dreams as a small kid. Awesome. Sitting on this porch with my home, with my husband, uh, being able to do a show now and then, that was my dream. So I'm doing the job that I'm supposed to do. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Took a long time. Mm -hmm. Took a lot. All right, what's a job you wouldn't want to do? Be the moderator of a presidential debate right now? <laughs> no, actually I would. Um, you know, yeah, I hate those answers where people go, oh, you should do what makes you happy. Well, sometimes that doesn't pay, you know? Um, and sometimes there are jobs I don't, I didn't always enjoy, but I understood their worth. I, I, I guess, any job that did not allow, did not allow me the freedom to not worry about how to buy groceries or put gas in the tank. There you go. Yeah. All right. Um, something, you know, the, the really important stuff. Oh. Your favorite swear word. Goddamn motherfucking cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. will be bleeped out. On Facebook, we'll bleep that out, but we'll, we'll put out a, a special G -D -M -F -C -S. version. G-D-M-F-C-S. <laughs> All right, good, good. Okay, so we had some write-in questions. Oh, um, oh, Lord. Yeah, these are very special and not completely made up by me because this is the first segment and we haven't had any oh, a chance for person? anyone. You are. I'm the first person? You're the first person oh, outside my, the actor's studio. My goodness, I feel privileged. All right, over really the years, do. over the years, who's been your favorite scene partner? Dick Bunton. Dick Bunton. Well, y'all played lots together. We played lots. Brothers. So we played brothers, lovers, husbands. Father and son. Father and son, rivals. Um, but maybe that's because, but you know, I've had some tremendous leading ladies as mm -hmm. well. You know, Cindy Colucci and I, back in our heyday, we did a lot of stuff together. I had a great time with Denise. Um, you know, I really love, um, you know, I had a great time in Peter and Starcatcher with that entire cast. Ensemble cast. Ensemble cast, yeah. All right. 
Um, let's see. Question number two. Uh, right in. Also, question. Tommy Hall was really fun. Oh. Y'all, young people, y'all don't remember him. And David Parker. I did a lot with, a lot with Tommy Hall and David Parker. So, how many times have you dressed in drag for a show? Not as many as people think. Uh, you've probably done more. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the first time I ever did it was for a show called The Lambda, which was a big cult hit here. But I didn't play the, the drag queen. Tommy Hull did. Mm -hmm. I played the male ingenue, the, the young male lead, the first iteration of it. And then when Steve Cooper rewrote it, I and it went from Tommy uh, mouthing Beverly Skinner's voice to me being sort of the performance artist and singing all the songs mm -hmm. and being the live entertainment. That was the first time, and I had a nervous breakdown preview night. Literally broke down, could not move. Lou had to come out of the audience oh, and, wow. and talk me down. Um, and what? I did a big Greek wedding a couple of years, and mm -hmm. then I did, did we count the pageant? Well, I mean, the, so the woman was beauty pageant, of course, yeah. we've done for 10 years here. We're both winners. Uh, <laughs> and, um, Hairspray. Hairspray, and then Lacage. Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla. Oh, and Bucalcicle. So what's that, oh, five yeah. or six? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So a, a good, good I don't, record. it's interesting. I never set out to do that. Right? Yeah. Neither did I. Yeah, Somehow I it just happens. I'd like to revisit Priscilla again. I add that onto it. <laughs> for a, for a, a third time. For a third time at the bus. <laughs> it was fun. It All was right. fun working with you and, and, and Blaine. Yes. Shout out to Blaine. Shout out to Blaine. Now, in 2010, you performed in Secret Garden, which you already mentioned, okay. uh, with a young, wide-eyed kid of <laughs> uh, playing the role of Dickon. What was your first impression of him? It's no pal Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, you know, I watched that the other day. Was was it on the Thursday mm -hmm. thing? Andy, my husband, hadn't seen it. And we were talking about you. Oh, um, <laughs> because I think it may be, I mean, one, you look the part. And it may be the best I've ever heard you sound in a show. Well, thank you. I mean, I, you really, that... It really sat really, really well with you. You had that sweet spirit about it, uh, and you know. Be, and I don't, I don't even remember. I remember some of the rehearsal process, mm -hmm. but I was so nervous about revisiting it, and I was so nervous about um, Lily's eyes mm -hmm. and making sure I could get the voice place that I didn't really get to know a lot of people, and I. I think that was, was that the first time we majorly worked together? It really was. It was. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember Lou throwing curse words left and right around the <laughs> area. <laughs> and, um, Bradley. Bradley. Uh, I thought you were great. I thought you were sweet. You were perfectly cast. And that's enough of ego stroking for me. No, we can talk a lot about this. <laughs> no, Jeff, thank you for doing this. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's it's, been a lot of fun. It's fun. It's really sort of odd to talk about your history. I mean, you know, 30 years has flown by. 30 years next season. And um, it's been it's been great. I mean, it's the people who come through the doors. And there aren't many of us who stick around right. that long. But uh, but thank you for doing this. Jason. Absolutely. I'm thank you for doing. all you're doing for Opera House, particularly during this odd time. I've got to so. stay busy somehow. Yeah. So everyone, take care of yourselves. Please take care of yourselves. And uh, if you if you have a chance and you uh, have the ability, please donate to Opera House. There's a link below, and uh, and we appreciate all your support. And uh, we'll get you next time. Thanks.